In this Elden Ring video, I'm going to be showing you my Noble Swordsman build. This is an all game build that focuses on the use of a single straight sword and no other weapon or shield and is phenomenal for guard breaking. If you saw our recent video on top early game builds, this is probably a build that I should have included in there. I think I will probably do another round of early game builds with five more because there are just so many good early game builds. But let's get into how this build works. So first of all, I am using the Noble Slender Sword here. You can farm this from the nobles that sort of wander around in the game. Limgrave is a very easy area to farm them. This weapon can take quite a long time to get. So if you don't want to farm this weapon, there are other options. The other option that I recommend, you know, immediately trying to get if you're not going to get this one, is the Lord Sworn Straight Sword. And the reason for that is both of these weapons have 110 critical rating, which means that when you go in for a critical strike, you're going to deal more damage than other straight swords that don't have as high a critical rating. The Lord Sword and Straight Sword can be farmed in Gatefront Ruins. is probably the easiest place to do it, but any, you know, soldier that's carrying this weapon can drop it. So you may need to farm there to get it. It's usually much faster than the Noble Slender Sword, though. The upside of the Noble Slender Sword is that it's longer. So you're going to have more reach with it, which is fantastic. The damage between these two weapons is pretty similar. I think the Noble Slender Sword comes out like a couple points of damage ahead. We're not talking enough damage-wise to really make it make the difference, but the length difference is substantial. So if you don't mind spending the time to farm this weapon, it's definitely the better of the two. And both of these weapons use the Square Off Ash of War by default, which means that you'll have to use their default scaling when you first pick up these weapons, which is perfectly fine if you're starting a new game because, you know, you're not really too worried about infusions at that point anyway. But later on, you'll be able to get this from Shifra River, and you'll be able to put, like, Dexterity Scaling on the Noble Slender Sword, which I think is probably what I do for this build if you're going to go with that weapon. If you're going with the Lord Sworn Straight Sword, Strength and Dexterity Scaling are about the same, so you could theoretically go a Strength build if you'd rather do that on that weapon. So it's kind of up to you as well. That might be another reason to pick the Lord Sworn Straight Sword over the Noble Slender Sword, especially if you want to add, like, a shield to this build, which I don't have. And the Square Off Ash of War is absolutely phenomenal, arguably one of the best in the game, and I should have really made a build around it earlier, but I wanted to showcase it here. And the way this Ash of War works is that when you hold L2, you kind of go into a stance with your sword, and then you can either press R1 or R2, and you're going to get two different attack animations depending on it. The R1 is kind of like a quick slash, and the R2 is kind of like a charge forward and thrust. Now, what's really great about this is this is a very cheap Ash of War. The R1 press is 6 FP and the R2 is 8. That's considerably less than a lot of Ash of Wars in this game. And the damage you gain from these is substantial. You can one-shot most enemies if you connect with an R1 early on in the game. So if you can, you know, increase your mind or you have like a couple blue flasks, you're going to be able to use this regularly on most enemies. And when you're playing this build, in my opinion, you want to try not to use your regular R1s or your R2s that much because this Ash of War, you know, with the R1 especially, is just better than a regular attack, hands down. So try and use the, you know, hold L2 and press R1 to attack enemies when possible, you know, as long as you have the FP to maintain that. But the real shining star of this is the holding L2, pressing R2, you know, charge forward and thrust. And the reason for that is the damage isn't that much higher than R1, but the stance damage it deals is 40 stance damage, and that's significant in this game. And the reason that's such an important number is that a lot of bosses in this game have 80 stance. So if you hit them with two of those attacks, they're going to stance break. Whereas if you hit them with the R1 attack, it's not going to be enough. You'll have to do three of them in a lot of cases in order to stance break them. Some bosses have more than 80 stance, and in those cases, it's not such a big deal. For bosses that have specifically 80 stance, like the Tree Sentinel, or Margit, or um, the Knight's Cavalry, or stuff like that, you can just hit them twice and they go down. Even Crucible Knight has 80 stance, so if you hit him with two of these you know, L2, R2 attacks, he's going to go down and then you can do a critical attack. And like Agil, for instance, Agil is 120 stance. That means if you do three of these, he goes down. That divides evenly perfectly, so that 40 number is really significant with the L2, R2 attack. The problem with this attack, though, is that it has a rather long, you know, animation compared to the R1. So sometimes you might be better off using the R1 because you know you can get it off without taking damage. But you're going to try and go for that R2 against bosses when you can in order to stagger them quickly and really use that R1 with the L2 against, you know, trash enemies. And that R1 also, the, the L2 R1 attack is fantastic at taking down enemies with shields. 
because a lot of times it'll just rip off all their stamina and you can go in for a critical attack. So definitely make sure you use that one against enemies with shields. So beyond that weapon, either the Noble Slender Sword or the Lord Sworn Straight Sword, I have no other weapons or anything really for this build. And you're going to either set that to Keen if you're playing Noble Slender Sword, or you're going to set it to Heavy or Keen if you're playing with the Lord Sworn Straight Sword. And the armor that I'm using for this build is a mishmash of the Page's armor and legs with the Perfumer's gloves and then the Noble's hat. And it kind of gives you this sort of like, you know, old school, like swordsman type look, which is kind of the namesake with the Noble hat, etc. And what I really like about this is really light, and I'm using the Blue Dancer charm for this build to further boost our damage. And because we're wearing, you know, such light gear, we're getting some, you know, decent damage out of this. We're getting about a 5% damage increase constantly from doing this. And you could take off other armor pieces if you want in order to further boost this damage. But if you're really min-maxing this build, in my opinion, and like you want to play this build as optimally as possible, you'd probably get rid of the Blue Dancer charm, and you would probably take some armor with higher poise, like 51 or higher. That way you could make sure that you could get stamp break, stance breaks more reliably. But in this case, I wanted to make like a light build that's kind of like, you know, a floaty swordsman with good rolls. And you don't really need the poise if you're playing well, in my opinion. I have no problem getting stance breaks with this build. And I just kind of like the look of it. But if you're talking about really min-maxing, you'd probably drop the blue dancer charm for something else. And you would wear armor with at least 51 poise. Other talismans I'm using for this build are the Warrior Jar Shard or Shard of Alexander. I have Shard of Alexander because it's a new game plus right here, gameplay wise. But if you're playing like regular, you know, very beginning of the game, Warrior Jar Shard is a better pickup. So you can use this throughout the whole game and it'll further boost the damage that you do with your square off attacks. I also have the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. This is to help me boost my defense. I'm wearing very paper thin armor, so getting extra physical defense is very nice. And even if you're playing with like a heavy armor set, this could be good for you, especially like when you're fighting very difficult enemies later on in the game, because, you know, you're going to try and trade a lot of times. You're trying to like get those off. You're playing aggressively to get stance breaks. And sometimes you take damage when you do that. And so it's kind of unavoidable and, and reducing the amount of damage you take when that happens is nice. A couple other good talismans for this build, Ritual Sword Talisman. This boosts your total damage when you're at full health. If you find you're not getting hit, this is great. Like if you walk into a boss fight, and you know you're going to just like stance break this boss really fast and you're not going to get hit. This is great because it not only boosts the damage of your Ash of War, boosts your regular attack damage if you're doing those, and it also boosts your critical damage. So this is very good to have for this build if you find you're not taking damage. And another really good talisman for this build is the Dagger Talisman. This boosts your critical strike damage. So, you know, when you stagger an enemy or stance break an enemy and you go in for that critical strike, it's going to boost that. A lot of enemies just die to your L2 R1, so this is not quite as beneficial out on the landscape. But if you are fighting like more challenging enemies or bosses, it can come in handy where you get, you know, one or two stance breaks in that fight. Especially if you know that you're probably going to take damage. I tend to swap this back and forth with Ritual Sword Talisman depending on what I'm fighting. And if you're talking about like a first playthrough also, Assassin's Cerulean Dagger can be really good for a first playthrough. Because it helps refund FP when you, you know, you do a critical strike on an enemy, which tends to happen quite often. So you can get a lot of FP back and you don't have to worry about your FP management as much. But, you know, as you get further and further in the game, you have way more flasks and you become a better player from playing. You don't really need that as much, particularly because it's a very cheap Ash of War. And a couple other things I really like, you can buff your weapon because we're playing, you know, keen and heavy infusions with any grease that you want, depending on what enemy you're facing. Like if they're weak to lightning, you can buff with lightning grease. If they're weak to fire, you can buff with fire. Or you can even throw like blood grease on there if you want to try and trigger bleeding once on a boss, you know, just if you know that they're, that boss is particularly weak, which is really great. Gives you a lot of flexibility with what you're fighting. And also because we're doing, you know, besides that buff, all the damage we deal is physical damage. Something like Exalted Flesh works really, really well to boost your physical attack damage. Or you could even take your Faith up to like 15 and use Flame Grammy Strength or something like that. You could do that if you want in order to boost your physical damage because you do, besides that buff, whatever grease, you're going to do exclusively physical damage. So it's really nice that it can work with those very well. And before we get into stats, though, I do want to re-mention that you can use a shield with this build if you want, if you put, like, no skill on it or something so that you can use your square off rather easily and you can use it for block counters if you want or something like that. I find I don't really need to have a need for it. Like, it's just kind of unnecessary the way that I play. But if you really want to have a shield, you could absolutely do that. And as I mentioned, the Lord Sword and Straight Sword might be better if you're going to do that because you can pick the heavy infusion and the damage is about the same as Keen. And a lot of, you know, shields and great shields have higher strength requirements. So that might be a better option if you want to do that. That's not how I did the build, but you absolutely could. Attribute-wise for this build, you should have around 50 Vigor, 30 Mind, you know, somewhere around 26, 27 Endurance, 8 Strength, ideally. 
80 dexterity. You don't need any intelligence, faith, or arcane for this build. I started as an astrologer, that's why I have that. But you could take faith up to 15 for flame grant me strength for like boss fights if you want. Or even 25 if you're talking like a new game plus playthrough to get you golden vow to buff your damage even more. But, you know, in a first playthrough, you probably won't have to worry about this at all. And really what we're going for here is a high enough health pool that we can absorb hits and still live. We are wearing very light armor, even though we do have Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. Enough mine that you can use, you know, square off as much as you want, not really worry about it. You're not really going to worry about this in your first playthrough too much. I think you probably take it up to 20, but as you go into like New Game Plus and beyond or the very end of a playthrough, you might start taking it up closer to 30. So you just have tons of it. You don't have to worry about it. Endurance is enough to make it so that we can light roll, uh, light roll with what we're wearing, depending on what armor you're wearing. This might not be important. Like if you went the, you know, 51 poise armor route, you're probably just looking at trying to make sure you have enough to medium roll. But if you want a light roll like I am here, you're going to need somewhere around that mark in order to be able to do it. We don't need 10 strength. Um, I was testing some things out. The Lord Sword and Straight Sword is 10 strength is necessary for that weapon. But if you are using the Noble Slender Sword like I am, then you only need 8. And obviously 80 dexterity is there because I set the Keen Infusion on the Noble Slender Sword. It drops off damage-wise significantly from this point onward. We're talking about a new game plus playthrough. At some point you'll probably just keep increasing dexterity anyway though just to get more damage. But, you know, it's like one point of damage for each point of dexterity at this point, which is pretty bad. And if you're talking about Flask of Wonders Physique for this build, there's really not that many good ones because you're basically just using your Ash of War most of the time and then doing critical attacks. So, you know, maybe um, getting one that boosts dexterity or strength could be good depending on your scaling early on in the game or even later in the game. And then I like to use the lead tier sometimes uh, in boss fights just because it gives me some poise that I can like hyper armor through and get those L2, L R2 presses off to stagger a boss even if they hit me. But you only have a very small window to do this in, so... You know, sometimes it just doesn't last long enough. So there is that as well. And if you're talking about what great runes are good for this build, I really like Radon's. This gives you health, FP, and stamina. All those things are useful for this build. Godric's is less effective on this build because you basically are only using four stats. So you really aren't getting as much out of it as a build that, you know, is using six or seven stats. So I think Radon's is the way to go there. So that wraps up my Noble Swordsman build. This is another very good early game build um, that'll carry you through the whole game that you can put together very, very quickly. These weapons are obtainable very quickly. The armor is not super hard to get, or you can use whatever armor you want. And what I really love is that in NG and NG+, Plus, the stance that bosses have remains the same. So you're going to be able to stance break in NG+, Plus just as easily as in NG, and their you know stance resistance doesn't start to increase until NG+, Plus 2. So it's very, very effective, and even though if you're just starting out, you're not going to be doing as much damage as I am because this is an NG+, the gameplay that you're seeing, the staggers are still going to happen at a reliable rate, and they're cheap. So you're going to be able to guard break or stance break these bosses like super fast and just keep knocking them down and getting particles. Stay tuned for more Elden Ring build videos, and we are going to be working on a new weapons video. I don't know which weapon we'll do next, but you can stay tuned for that.